good afternoon again. We will talk about uh, frictional resistance now. Uh, William Froude in the 1860s and later on his son Ari Froude conducted a number of experiments on planks to have a formulation for frictional resistance. William Froude gave a formulation for uh, frictional resistance based on Planck experiments. He did a number of experiments on Planck's that is uh, of a particular length and height submerged in water and tore them and measured the resistance. Based on the Planck experiments, he gave a formulation R is equal to, mind you this is purely frictional formulation. F F V to the power n. This was the original formula. In the original formula, resistance was given in pounds, pound force, S was in feet square and speed was in feet per second. But now you can convert the formula to metric units, F and n being two constants, where F n was dependent on length of the body, length of the plank and F was dependent on the surface finish of the plank. That is, William Froude was also the first person to detect that frictional resistance would depend on the roughness of the surface. So, since Reynolds, Reynolds number was not explicitly used in this, the n factor varied based on the lengths for which he conducted experiments for various lengths. And lengths were not very large, the lengths were up to a limit when you can tow it, tow it in a towing tank, mainly the towing tank at Torquay where he did most of his experiments in England. F was dependent on the surface finish, the, sur the more roughness that the surface had, F increased. He varnished the surfaces. He roughened the surfaces by sandpaper. He also put uh, sand particles on the surfaces to make it more rough. So, from very smooth to very rough surfaces he tested and he gave a set of values which were used till quite late, uh, maybe till uh, mid 50s as a method of estimating the frictional drag of uh, planks, two dimensional bodies and even ships. Okay, slowly, uh, there came this gentleman Osmond Reynolds who said, who made a lot of experiments of flow through pipes. I suppose you might have uh, read about uh, Reynolds experiments of flow through pipes, where he allowed water to flow through pipe through glass pipe so that he could observe the flow pattern. And of course, it played, played clean water flowed through, nothing happened. But then he injected dyes at the surface. Osmond Reynolds realized that there must be a friction between the surface of the solid particle, uh, solid uh, pipe and the fluid flowing through it. So, he injected dye at the surface and saw the movement of the dye. Uh, what he found is very interesting that as the dye started leaving the surface for some length, the dye flew in straight line form. That is, there is a pattern in the flow of the dye. It went, it separated from the surface, but it went more or less parallel to the surface, slowly separating. But as the length of uh, uh, the dye injection uh, point uh, moved away from the fluid particle, that is the fluid flew over longer distance, the fluid got disturbed and it mixed up with the water, leaving no pattern. This also he found that the length, the distance over which the dye maintained a pattern, you understand what I am saying, the dye maintained a pattern of flow more or less parallel to the surface. You, you know, if this was the pipe, the dye injected here moved like this and then it got mixed up. This distance 
was some distance which he saw that the fluid would flow smoothly then got mixed up. The, he observed that this smoothness of flow, the length of smooth flow reduced if he increased the speed, speed of water. That is this length was dependent on speed. Okay. Now, this he said the speed at which the water the dye got mixed up with water he called it the critical speed and a critical speed by experiments repeated experiments he found the critical speed as 2000 mu by d or V c d by nu is equal to 2000. Now, you see what is this quantity? This is Reynolds number for a pipe. Do you get that? So, he found that 2000 Reynolds number was critical for the fluid to mix up with the water and before 2000 the water this did not mix up with the water. What do we infer from this? Yes up to about 2000 Reynolds number in a pipe, the flow was of one pattern and after 2000, the flow was of another pattern. Now, we know that a boundary layer will develop next to a solid uh, boundary. Okay. Now, the boundary layer will be 0 at the beginning and slowly increase in thickness and of a, up to a certain length, the fluid inside it will have a predominant, will have a velocity which is predominantly parallel to the axis of the pipe till here. Do you understand? Though there will be a velocity gradient, that is velocity will vary from the pipe uh, end till the end of the boundary layer there will be a velocity gradient as we have discussed previously, but each point the velocity will be primarily in this direction. Do you understand? That is how he can observe the fluid, the dye going like this, but beyond a certain point the fluid velocity will become totally random, a overlaying flow will be there. But if you take what we call perturbation velocity, that over the flow of pipe main flow here, the small little velocities that determine the particle direction at any point, that will be random. That can go parallel, that can go perpendicular upwards, perpendicular downwards or backwards. Am I clear? This is what he found. That is, though there will be overlaying flow velocity in one direction, for a certain range of Reynolds number, the perturbation velocity of each particle inside the boundary layer will be parallel to the axis of the pipe, but beyond a certain Reynolds number, that perturbation velocity will be randomly distributed in all directions. That is how the fluid gets mixed up. This is very interesting and that is what we call laminar boundary layer and turbulent boundary layer. Okay. That is this we can call laminar boundary layer, that is uh, boundary layer can be laminar or turbulent. Am I clear? And what is laminar boundary layer? As we have said that the velocities inside the boundary layer will be predominantly parallel to the axis or parallel to the surface. If it is a three dimensional, three dimensional surface, will be parallel to the surface. And in turbulent boundary layer, the velocities will be random inside the boundary layer. Okay. Now, 
we have already seen in case of ship rf can be represented by frictional resistance coefficient as rf divided by half rho s v square to estimate cf we don't have much information from the pipe experiment there are people way back in uh, early 20th century a theoretical exposition was given to flow around planks for laminar flow by a man called blasius so we have the blasius formulation for laminar flow and the resistance of a plank to laminar flow that is the blasius formulation for laminar flow okay now this also doesn't fulfill our requirement because flow around ships is basically turbulent now you see we have given um, osmond reynolds gave the critical reynolds number for a pipe as 2000 and in case of ships it will change because you don't have a diameter and the flow phenomenon may be different it will be primarily dependent on length factor but how much length we'll see there will also be a critical reynolds number in case of ships where uh, flow will change from laminar to turbulent now imagine the ship is a long thin body water is flowing past it initially at the beginning of the flow where length is small just like in pipes there will be a portion when the flow will be laminar and as the length increases reynolds number increases flow will turn to turbulent there will be a zone between laminar and turbulent where there will be a transition from laminar to turbulent and it's very difficult to define where that zone will be because understand that ship will also have a surface which is not strictly smooth nor is it very rough if you are talking of a new ship similarly ship is also different from the point of view that uh, it is not like a plank it's a three dimensional surface so much can be understood that initially there may be a portion where there will be some laminar flow and then the flow will become turbulent this is definitely so in models in ships this is slightly reduced this effect of laminar flow is slightly reduced because the ship surface is generally having enough roughness to induce turbulent turbulence even at the early stages of flow at the beginning so we consider the flow around a ship to be mostly turbulent flow okay now prantl and von karman in 1921 gave a formulation for theoretical formulation again for cf in boundary layer in turbulent boundary layer which is mind you this was also for flat pl uh, planks two dimensional flow without any edge effect and as if the flow was only in two dimensions without having any curvature so this showed if i draw the two curves if i draw as a function of reynolds number this should be something like uh, laminar flow and this should be something like turbulent flow this is see this is laminar this is turbulent you can say this is prantl and von karman and this is blasius 
see the difference turbulent flow has a completely different characteristics from laminar flow so if we take laminar flow then we are bound to get into trouble we will be underestimating resistance then uh, in 1940s and early 50s a gentleman called Froner in uh, uh, United States did a lot of experiments or rather collected a lot of data on Planck experiments, took the uh, Prankel and von Kármán formulation. See, Prankel and von Kármán formulation is basically a theoretical formulation. So, he took all the Planck data available till that time, resistance data and took the theoretical formulation of Prankel and von Kármán and tried to fit all the resistance data in a statistical manner following the formulation of Prankel and von Kármán and he arrived at a uh, friction line for two dimensional flow. We will not elaborate more than this, we will only say two dimensional flow. Now, whether it is correct or not was not known at that time, but it was thought to be better than uh, the Prankel and von Kármán formulation. So, the formulation that we got by Schoner's line was like this. Okay. So, you uh, see the CF occurring on both sides. So, it is not a very straightforward calculation C f equal to so much and you calculate the right hand side you get back. You have to do go do through a little bit of iteration process to arrive at some value where the C f on the right hand side and left hand side are equal. Anyway, this is uh, Soner's line. Soner's friction line. which was accepted by ATTC, American Towing Tank Conference and called the ATTC line. Till this time, till this line came, the background of this is only planks, smooth planks stored in water and from there this line, uh, this was early 50s. Then Around the same time, a gentleman called Hughes was doing a large number of experiments in UK with uh, pontoons, which are not pontoon cross section. You see, if you want to the two dimensional uh, bodies, then they will be nice and smooth, like long, narrow bodies without any separation effect. And he did a large number of experiments with pontoons where these bodies were wall sided. And he did large number of experiments, which he said were also having two dimensional flow. So, he went up to 100 feet length pontoons, moved them in open sea, oh, not open sea, open tanks, and collected all the plank experiment, all the pontoon experiment, put all the data together, and he came up with a formulation. Uh, of frictional resistance, which is given as I will use the term C F 0 now, 0 indicating two dimensional flow. So, this was the hugest friction line. As you see, there are uh, this was predominantly two dimensional flow, which varied a little bit from Sonus line, but nearly same. One would not say nearly same, but uh, one would not say same, one can only say nearly same having differences at lower Reynolds numbers, but at a higher Reynolds number, 
becoming more or less equal. Around this time, the International Towing Tank Conference was meeting and this was a debate what should be a ship friction line so that we can use it for model and ship as per our model experimental procedure. And they are debating quite a lot. In 1957, Sonus line and Hughes line were both brought to ITTC and ITTC in its wisdom decided that Hughes line was more nearer to two dimensional flow friction line and with this as basis they formulated a line which was slightly different from here. To make it easier what they did is this 2.03 that you see here was reduced to 2 and this was slightly increased. So, the ITTC line came to be This became the ITTC friction line, which as you can see is slightly higher than Hughes friction line. At this point of time, ITTC did not want to say this is a friction line, because though large number of experiments were done by this time for two dimensional flow, whenever you are talking of two dimensional flow, there will be end somewhere. If you have a pontoon that must have a closure that disturbs the flow. Plus, what happens to three dimensional flow? That was also something not known, and people are still groping in the dark. And the resistances that were predicted from model experiments by using any of these three lines did not match very well with full scale trials that were done in various at various times, starting with Greyhound in 1800s. So, there are still some lacuna. Therefore, ITTC in its wisdom thought that telling it, telling it as a friction line will be limiting it. So, they set this line as ship model correlation line. That is, this line will be used to correlate the model resistance with the resistance. That is, the same line will be used to calculate C S 0 for model and for ship. Am I clear? There is another difference between uh, a ship frictional resistance and a model friction resistance. Model normally made of wax or wood finished to very nice finish or FRP is very smooth and ship is whatever you do, you can never get that smoothness. If we measure the ship's roughness in microns, it will be of the order of 125 microns, micron is 10 to the power minus 9 and if you measure that for a model, it will be 25 microns, nearly that of glass, a well finished model. So, then you can see the roughness in ship is much more than the model, that had to be accounted for for extrapolation to model scale. So, uh, apart from that, they also said the ship must be given a correlation allowance. This is correlation line. On top of this, there must be written a given a correlation allowance. C A A they called it or C A as 0.4 in 10 to the power minus 3. For extrapolating the ship resistance, model resistance to ship resistance. That is C T m is equal to C f 0 m plus C r m, C r m is equal to C r s and C T s is equal to C f 0 s using the same formulation plus C r s which is nothing but equal to C r m plus C s. Is that clear? Okay. Now comes 
we still haven't talked about the three dimensional effect on friction shift body is three dimensional i have been telling this from the beginning so far whatever formulation we have got including the ittc formulation is predominantly two dimensional do i make myself clear if it is predominantly two dimensional ittc has made a very uh, feeble effort at adding a small allowance to heat resistance but it is not really three dimensional because three dimensional effect on two dimensional resistance should be quite large should be so for this purpose a lot of work has been done and we can try and find out if we can determine what is the three dimensional form effect in that case we can say cf is equal to 1 plus k cf0 where cf0 is two dimensional frictional resistance coefficient and k is the so called form factor or a factor by which the frictional resistance increases for a three dimensional body above a two dimensional body it can be understood that cf0 here we will be we'll using ittc friction law okay you see when we said ct is equal to cf plus cr this cf was function of reynolds number this cr was function of hood number now we are saying that actually this cf is slightly more than the ittc cf so if i say this cf 0 into 1 plus k if i write it here like this then this whole thing is depends on reynolds number and this thing depends on hood number am i making myself clear the extrapolation laws are different the cr extrapolation is same as that of ship cf extrapolation is by using the ittc friction line which we have discussed this k is a part of cf so previously this k was not a part of cf and it was taken same as this component of k into cf0 was taken same as ship and model same as ship and model it was part of sgi resistance am i understood are you getting what i am saying or you are not getting okay now the problem is suppose we say this is correct how do you determine k how do you determine k after all when we move a ship we are getting the total resistance how do you get in fact we didn't get even cf0 so we have taken a ittc line how do you get k now you can see we can use some basic physical phenomena to understand this suppose my ship is moving at very low speed 1 or 2 knots i'll have hardly any wave making we have seen that wave making is a phenomenon of speed right so if my ship is moving at very low speed the total resistance is only frictional in nature so i can tow a model at very low speed measure the resistance that gives me total frictional resistance right if i write it down at low fn cr is equal to 0 so ct is equal to 1 plus k cf0 cf0 i know so 1 plus k equal to ct divided by cf0 at low fluid number am i right this is the basis on which we can calculate k for the model and use the same k for the ship there are some assumptions we have made in this that k is independent of speed that is k will be same over the entire speed range otherwise doing it at low speed we cannot use it at high, higher speed a fair assumption i don't think it's very unfair that's a fair assumption 
but there are some practical problems. At low speed, the resistance itself will be very low, right. You know in any experimental procedure, there is always some small error and this small error over a small quantity, when you manipulate with this by dividing things, you can get a very large error. That is k itself can be largely erroneous while dealing with small speed. If your experiments are very accurate, you will tend towards getting the accurate result. But this is the method which has been accepted by ITTC and if you can do speed measurements and resistance measurements at very low speed accurately, this should give you reasonably good value of k. Normally, it is recommended that this measurement should be done at f n equal to 0 0.1. Fruit number 0.1, normally you should do this. There is another method by which we can uh, estimate uh, k value. I will briefly tell you. If I write down C t is equal to 1 plus k, now I can drop C f 0 and write C f, always meaning C f means two dimensional or I t t c line. And when I write 1 plus k, it becomes three dimensional. C r we have seen is a function of fruit number. It can be roughly said to be a function of a power of fruit number between 4 to 6. If I have this, I divide the whole thing by C f, then I get C t by C f is equal to 1 plus k plus C f n to the power n divided by C f. So, then if I know this n value and this c value, then I can calculate 1 plus k, right. Now, this is now possible using some mathematical technique, you can fit a curve to the equation to a resistance curve, find out the value of n and c to the residual resistance and calculate the value of k. This is the other method which is also recommended by ITTC, but as you know since the errors are not constant over the entire speed range, measurement range and neither are the positive errors always, the error can be positive or negative. This type of fitment, regression equation fitment to find out what is the value of n and c can also give erroneous results. So, the result is, why am I talking about all these things? The result is though we know that there is a three dimensional frictional resistance and we make an attempt to estimate it, our estimation is always suspect. Am I clear? Okay. Let us see by plotting the resistance graph what information we can get. So, I put Reynolds number here and C t here. C t C f we will see what is. Uh, the I t t c friction line will go like this. So, if you see the friction formulation we have given you will find it will decrease with increasing Reynolds number. So, this is C f, I can write here I t t c, so that we do not confuse. As the Reynolds number increases, C f reduces. On top of this, let me plot my model resistance curve. Let me plot this. Now, at low speed, 
this is actually low speed, this is high speed. This Reynolds number range for the model is exaggerated here, it won't even be so much, it will be something like this. Okay. So, at low speed, as you have discussed, this resistance, the there is no we are making resistance or no C R and the entire resistance is C S. But this is ITTC friction line. What we see here is our actual resistance is higher than the ITTC friction line. So, if we take that as the friction line as if the I we that gives us the K here, this value divided by this value gives us 1 plus K, right. So, if we now plot multiply this C F I T T C with 1 plus k, we will get a line more or less parallel to the this line. Okay. Now, we can plot the shift resistance curve on top of this. This is the shift Reynolds number. So, if the this was C R. Same C R will come here. This C R is same. How much is this? This is K into C S. <coughs> this much. Similarly, this much will be the C S M into C S S. So, this whole amount will be 1 plus k C S. Okay. Is that clear? This we can utilize, this principle we can utilize for determining the k by doing a set of tests which is called geozim test. That is, I make two models of the ship to two different scales. I can make a model of 5 meters length of a 125 meter vessel scale, 1 is to 25 uh, uh, ratio and another I can make 1 is to 36 ratio. If I do two models and I get these two curves actually, this is Reynolds number. I get a CT of a one model and a CT of the other model. Then at the constant fruit number, the CR will be same and the remaining part will be 1 plus k C s, right. If I have got my C f here, C f i t t c already got, right. And if I join the same fruit number lines, they should be parallel to each other if what I am telling is correct, because the C f is same. And from here, I can see which line it is parallel to and I can draw the main 1 plus k C f line. See in this case, we extrapolated, please understand this. This is ship, this is model, the previous case. We had only this line and we had this line. We estimated k and drew this line plotted this and found the ship curve, we extrapolated. Here in geozim test, this is model 1 and this is model 2, both these are available with us, both the data is available with us, understood. So, it is easier for us to calculate the k by drawing the constant fruit number lines right till the end and if there is an error, we can pair the curve, so they are parallel to each other, because the C r is constant and then we can have a better estimate of k value. 
Am I clear? No. Okay. CT model 1 is equal to CF into 1 plus K, CF 1 into 1 plus K plus CR. CT model 2, remember we are doing at corresponding speeds, I need not mention it every time. CR is same. So, now deduct CT 1 minus CT 2 is equal to C F 1 minus C F 2 1 plus K. All these four quantities are known. Yes, we do it for a number of speeds, number of fruit numbers and you will get 1 plus k values, they should be same, but because of experimental inaccuracies you will not get the same values, but you will get nearly same values and we can take the average, that will give us the exact k value. From geosim test, it is possible to estimate the k value exactly, but of course it is very expensive and should we be doing it at all, should we be doing the test so much. What are you looking for? You are looking for an estimate of resistance so that you can satisfy the trial condition requirement and the service condition requirement. Service condition requirement as we have seen is not very well known. We can just leave a margin on the trial resistance to satisfy any service condition. We will go for more accurate prediction process spending more money by doing geosim tests or whatever, only if it benefits us in an economic sense, right. Now, if suppose we did not use K, what will we be extrapolating? Suppose we, we extrapolate uh, ship resistance as this only, this is as per ITTC and CR m as we have calculated by deducting ITTC. What are we doing? Are we overestimating the ship resistance or are we underestimating? Can you tell me? If we do not use 1 plus k, what are we doing? We are for the ship we are overestimating, we are on the higher side because the CF which is reducing with speed is a small value, we have multiplied with 1 plus k, CR has remained same, more percentage of resistance we are taken to the residuary part and that is remaining same, okay. So, actually you are predicting resistance which is higher because you have ignored the three dimensional frictional form effect. So, you are on the safe side. If you take form factor, then you will become more accurate and your power prediction will reduce. So, that is beneficial from the point of your actual economy. You get it, but it is fraught with the danger if it is not estimated properly, then you may underestimate it the k has to be estimated very well. If you are unable to estimate k properly, do not use it. That is the advice that can be given. So, if you look at uh, the towing tanks world over, you will find that some tanks use the form factor, some tanks do not use the form factor. ITTC has left it open by saying that the phenomenon of three dimensional frictional resistance effects are not very well known. Is that clear? So, now you do your model experiments, the procedure is known to you and you can extrapolate from model scale to full scale. Okay, we will stop here. Thank you.
gentlemen, yesterday we had seen, uh, uh, we have talked about uh, frictional resistance of ships, let us talk about wave making resistance today. But before that, just to brush up, we had said before that total resistance of a ship comprises of two parts, that is RF plus RR, frictional resistance plus residual resistance. This was based on Fruit's law of similarity. RF we had seen is primarily the two dimensional frictional resistance or something similar to flat plank resistance, frictional resistance. This RF we said we calculated using ITTC friction line of 1957 and the residual resistance was told to be the remaining part of resistance. If we divided the ship's total resistance into two parts, that is the two dimensional frictional resistance RF, then the remaining part of the total resistance was called the residual resistance. If we go back further than that, in our first class we had divided the various components of resistance which we will again see in the next lecture. Uh, you will recall that we had said that the frictional resistance, the two dimensional frictional resistance alone is not the total component of viscous resistance. There would be some other components of viscous resistance which may be small in quantity but they are there and they are not included in this ITTC 57 line. Similarly, when you talked about pressure resistance, we said the pressure resistance is equal to the wave making resistance but there could be some interference between the frictional resistance and pressure resistance thereby giving something we call viscous pressure drag. I have got a wave like this. Now, I have got another set of waves starting from here going like this and this is my water line here and this is for this wave, this is the water line. If I add this up, what am I getting? This wave will come like this as it is coming and here it will increase this plus this, is not it? and this is the aft of the ship. Therefore, it will push the ship forward. We have seen the pressure increase in the aft supports motion. Is that clear? That means, the resistance will reduce. Yes. On the other hand, if there is a trough here, suppose this was a trough, then what will you get? This will flatten out. That means, the support that you are getting at least here, you are not getting anymore. So, there is an increase in resistance. Am I understood? So, the interference of the waves will either increase the resistance or decrease the resistance or it may not matter. Any of these can happen. Uh, this interference will depend on the speed of the ship. Now, when the wave is moving forward, the ship is moving forward, since it is generating waves as it moves forward, the transverse waves will have a velocity equal to the velocity of the ship. Therefore, the transverse wave length, wave length of transverse wave will be equal to 2 pi v square by g, where v is the speed of the ship. You imagine this is the this is my ship, the other transverse waves. These waves will move at the same speed as the ship. I have identified wave crest as one parameter which will give me the wave making resistance. Forward wave crest is the prime 
component of the total wave making resistance, prime variable. So, to reduce that, one of the methods I can adopt is to reduce the angle at the water line itself, because as I go down, the effect of the slope will be reduced on the free surface. I know that. It will be there, but it will reduce as the height, as the point dips more and more below the free surface. So, maximum impact is of that slope near the water line. So, if I can reduce the slope on the water line, then I can control my wave making resistance and this angle is called half angle of entrance. Okay. Is that clear? So, I have, we have seen the effect of length on wave making resistance, we have seen the effect of speed on wave making resistance, now we have seen the effect of half angle of entrance. Now, this gives you a very interesting observation. If I reduce the beam, see after all a ship has to carry a lot of, it has to have a particular volume of displacement. That I can give over smaller length, larger breadth or longer length, smaller breadth. So, if I have a narrower ship, then this angle will be less. That is, if my L by B ratio is increasing, then my wave making resistance is coming down. My half angle of entrance is automatically down. That is one way. And there are many other ways. In the next hour, we will see what is the effect of the bulb. Okay? Thank you. Good afternoon. We will talk about other components of resistance. We have actually seen how the frictional resistance around a ship can be estimated. We have seen the physics of wave making around a ship hull form. We have also seen that waves when they interfere with each other, it can be supportive to motion or opposing the motion. Basically, we have seen that wave making resistance has a component, the major component which is proportional to speed raised to the power 6 and over which there are small humps and hollows created due to interference of the bow, stern and aft shoulder, forward shoulder waves. This is what we have seen in the uh, this thing. Now, can we utilize this interference? in a manner that we can reduce the bow wave component itself. We have said before that if I have a submarine below the water surface, I will still have a wave effect just below the water surface because the depth is not very large, so the wave effect will not be there. Can we utilize this? For example, I have got a ship which generates a bow wave system. Can I have a body, a sphere for example, somewhere below the surface in the front of the ship, which is placed in such a location that it creates a wave trough where a bow wave crest existed. C form is the form component which takes into account the major difference, major uh, uh, portion of the augment of resistance, augment of viscous resistance over two dimensional form factor, two dimensional friction resistance. Do you get my point? That is C form, I can say is mainly augment of two dimensional frictional resistance on total viscous resistance. Okay. So, we can say C form includes the three dimensional friction form effect, it also includes some amount of 
separ separation drag component and viscous component. Imagine separation we have said is related to velocity and pressure, they will change with velocity of the ship. So, if it is something at low speed, it cannot be the same at high speed. So, truly speaking we have not taken this into total into account, that is why I am saying mainly, the word mainly is important there, it is not total. There is a problem here, we have already discussed for a normal ship how difficult or how accurate it is to extrapolate to full scale. In the, we have said the C form, uh, form coefficient we have talked about, we have said there are some inaccuracies and it is not exactly understood. On top of that you have now added appendages. So, the extrapolation may create problem. So, to be on the safer side, one could do a naked hull resistance test and another the hull modified with appendages and test it. So, estimate the appendage drag separately and extrapolate the ship's naked hull resistance separately and appendage resistance separately and add them together. That is another way you can go ahead and do it. So, these are some of the methods by which the ship resistance can be estimated and extrapolated. We will talk about extrapolation once again because that is the most important thing accuracy of the extrapolation method to full scale for power prediction. We may look at this if time permits once again later on. Uh, what other resistance can be there? Can you name? For very high speeds, there may be a spray drag or if the rudder or some such appendage is pierced in the water, it may generate spray. So, there can be sometimes a spray drag, but normal ships do not have this and even then the spray drag may be of less magnitude. So, we do not normally consider it. And if we go for higher speed, the high speed craft the resistance characteristics are quite different and we will talk about it when we talk of high speed crafts. Thank you. Good afternoon gentlemen, yesterday we had seen uh, uh, 
we have talked about uh, frictional resistance of ships. Let's talk about wave making resistance today. But before that, just to brush up, we had said before that total resistance of a ship comprises of two parts that is Rf plus Rr, frictional resistance plus residual resistance. This was based on Prout's law of similarity. Rf we had seen is primarily the two dimensional frictional resistance or something similar to flat plank resistance, frictional resistance. 